I mean, the blank check company was dropping a roughly $4 billion deal to buy 10% of Universal Music Group, home to stars like Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga. In a letter to investors in his SPAC, Ackman said the SPAC's board unanimously decided not to move forward. This after the SEC privately took issue with several elements of the proposed deal that uh, could have potentially blocked it, including whether its structure met NYSC rules. Now, Ackman says he still intends to become a long-term universal shareholder when the company owned by French group uh, Vivendi goes public in September. Um, his SPAC will now look for a new combination target. And joining us right now exclusively to talk about that and so much more is Bill Ackman, CEO of Pershing Square Capital Management. Bill, it's great to see you this morning, uh, to be able to talk to you on a morning uh, when this headline uh, emerged and this deal has effectively been called off. I, I do know that your hedge fund will now step into the place effectively uh, of uh, the SPAC, but tell us what happened. Sure. Uh, so just to rewind, um, if we go back just a few weeks, uh, we announced the transaction and a couple weeks later, uh, before we signed the deal, the SEC came to us and said, we have some concern about whether Remainco, this entity we were creating, was going to become an investment company. And in order to address the SEC's concern, we changed the structure of the deal to provide that we were going to contribute the stock that we purchased to a trust. And we thought that would address the issue. And then we signed the deal, and then we pushed forward with the transaction. And then actually in the last, this week, the last few days, the SEC raised, I would say, a deal killer, which is they, they said that in their view, uh, the transaction did not meet the New York Stock Exchange uh, SPAC rules. And what that meant, what, I would call that a dagger in the heart of the transaction, and put you know, Tontine in a very awkward you know, spot. And uh, you know, we love Universal. We were excited to bring this deal to uh, the Pershing Square Tontine shareholders. Um, not being able to do the transaction, uh, we offered to take it off the hands of the public company that was actually built into the transaction, the right to assign to an affiliate. And uh, we've uh, also assumed an indemnity obligation, some expenses, so that we put Tontine kind of back in the place where it was as if we hadn't done the deal. And now we have 18 months to find another transaction, and that one's going to be a merger. You know, this one, we structured the way we did really to uh, accommodate the ability to acquire Universal because we were so excited about the business and we wanted it to be owned uh, by our shareholders. Um, you know, SEC didn't like it, um, and therefore we uh, were going to find we're going to do a more conventional merger. But we, our intent was to do a Bill. merger all along. It was really uh, Vivendi's, uh, you know, some issues on their side that caused us to structure the deal this way. Bill, was this just too complicated? Uh, you know, I think a lot of us, including myself, struggle to be able to articulate and explain to the public what exactly uh, this was. It was very different in many ways than a traditional SPAC. Clearly, uh, the investors also uh, felt perhaps that this was too complex because uh, they, they started selling effectively the shares and, then, and, they, and they fell in price. Sure, so what happened was, I think, we really have two kinds of investors. When we went public, <clears throat> we got to select all the investors and we picked investors who had a very long-term orientation. They wanted to, you know, for, they were kind of going to be partners with us in buying a business we own for the next, you know, multiple years, in our case, you know, probably a decade or more. And then I would say the Reddit community got excited about Tontine, and a lot of shorter-term investors came in and said, look, I want to bet on a deal being announced, you know, the day one pop. A lot of those investors were levered. A lot of those investors bought options. And we announced a deal that, unfortunately, is very bad if you're levered, or if you own options, because when we, uh, you know, the requirement to put the stock in a trust account is very uh, detrimental of your margin holder. It's also very detrimental if you're an option holder. So we probably had none of those investors came into the IPO, but by the time of announcement, about a third of our stock, I think, was held by people hoping, you know, that we're going to announce a transaction where the stock doubles, you know, if you will, the first day. There are a lot of investors that have been investing in SPACs right. uh, that way, and I have no no issue with a short-term investor, and we. Uh, we didn't design the transaction to affect short-term investors, but we were really focused on creating kind of long-term value. What's interesting is all of these problems go away by the end of the year. Um, you know, the issues that people were concerned about is, one, my stock that you buy and I'm going to get, I'm not going to get for four months. It's going to sit in a trust account. We didn't right. like that, uh, but that was really something, you know, we had to do for regulatory reasons. Bill, Another issue, where, Universal, where, I was, just stick with it for one second, but Universal is going to be a, a Dutch-listed company. People didn't love that, but we believed you know, by the time that we distribute the stock to shareholders, it would likely be, uh, hopefully be a New York Stock Exchange listed company. So each of these problems 
if you could hold the stock for six months, I think people would do very, very well. But unfortunately, I would say a meaningful percentage of our investors needed to hold it for a much shorter period of time. Right. And the, you know, it had a, a negative impact on them. And that, that, I think, has driven the stock down. Bill, what was the mistake, though, here? Because clearly the, the SEC was preparing to block the deal or to make it very difficult for you to close on time. Did you get bad advice from your lawyers? Did you try to press ahead despite the bad advice? How do you think about that? Sure, we have great lawyers. I mean, uh, you know, Joe Schenker, Scott Miller, Selvin Cromwell, Steve Fraden, Greg Patty at uh, Cadwallader. You know, we have uh, you know, Steve Bigler, one of the best Delaware uh, lawyers. We have great lawyers, um, you know, but we don't just rely on lawyers. We read the law ourselves. And in this case, uh, you know, if you look at the New York Stock Exchange rules, uh, there's a rule called, uh, I think it's 10206, which is the SPAC requirements. What's interesting is in January or early February, I called the New York Stock Exchange and I told them about the transaction. I didn't tell them the company, but I, I talked to them about the structure. I described it. It's really their rules. And these are not SEC rules on SPACs. And they, New York Stock Exchange, I would say up until Thursday was extremely supportive of this uh, transaction. Um, they understood the structure. They liked our spark structure, uh, which was this uh, warrant that we're going to issue to our shareholders. Uh, they were excited about it. The only disappointment they had is that Universal wouldn't be initially listed on the exchange. So we had the support of the exchange. Uh, we, our lawyers, you know, uh, gave us, you know, from the first week when we realized we had to do this as a stock purchase transaction, they reviewed the, the rules. They were quite comfortable. And if you read the rules yourself, the rules give a number of, you know, SPACs don't have to do mergers. They can do asset purchases. According to the rules, they can do stock purchases. Right. Uh, and we're not the first SPAC to buy a minority interest in a uh, private company and distribute it to shareholders. There are other, you know, examples, and that gave us confidence. Now, we're a super high profile, profile firm. Uh, it's a very large SPAC. I would say the SEC is really, really carefully scrutinizing every SPAC transaction. I think they should, although... I would argue what's interesting here is, you know, the reason why they should scrutinize SPAC transactions is many SPACs are merging with zero revenue companies at crazy valuations. The sponsors putting up, you know, numbers saying here's what the EBITDA is going to be in five years. And a lot of retail investors pile in, the stock pops, and then people get hurt. And I think that's motivated Chairman Gensler to focus on SPACs. In our deal, we're buying one of the greatest companies in the world. It has almost no debt. It's got, you know, it's enormously profitable. Its margins are growing. It's got a great long-term trajectory. We're taking no founder stock, no compensation, and even the warrants we bought that we paid $65 million for, we're tearing up in this transaction. So we're literally investing a billion six. Our shareholders are investing four billion. We're all buying the same, we're all getting the same common stock, and there's no dilution to our shareholders. So all the reasons why I think the SEC should be focused on SPACs don't apply here. And so I find it a bit striking that the SEC stopped this deal. Right. Uh, when I view, again, it's, it's not great. The, the, the negative aspects are the trust, uh, which goes away in four months. You know, it's a long time for many investors, forever for a short-term investor. But that was actually driven by something the SEC uh, was focused on, which was, you know, again, Bill, in that case, uh, uh, the Investment Company Act. Yes. Now that the transaction isn't happening as a, as a SPAC, just to put a fine point on it, Pershing Square, the hedge fund, is effectively stepping into... Uh, those shoes. So you will now become an even larger owner of Universal Music Group. How are uh, Tontine shareholders uh, who were happy about this deal supposed to think about that? Well, if you're a Tontine shareholder and you wanted this deal, you should call the SEC and complain, I guess. I, I would say that would be my first call. I guess the good news for the smaller investor is that Universal is going to become a public company at the end of September, Vivendi is going to basically you know, call it a spin-off or a dividend or distribution. They're going to distribute 60% of the stock to the public. You'll have a chance to buy the shares uh, there. Um, we, do, we did have a lot of very supportive shareholders who liked the structure of the transaction, liked that we were taking no warrants, uh, liked that there was a second bite of the apple where we had a smaller entity called Remainco. And again, for, for our investors' trouble, we gave them a gift, if you will. You know, this spark warrant, which again, I, I, I hear the, I hear you on complexity, but complexity is okay if you're getting something for free. And actually, Spark is a quite an interesting entity. Uh, I do believe at some point, you know, once we get this entity approved, um, it's a, a much. You know, what we've tried to do is move the go from SPAC 1.0 to SPAC 2.0. You know, Tontine was SPAC 2.0. No founder stock, no compensation, great alignment, uh, purchase of a warrant. 
but it had two problems. One is opportunity cost of capital, like every other SPAC, you put up money, you gotta wait. Uh, the other problem is pressure on the sponsor, if you will, to do a deal. And we've solved those problems with this entity called Spark, which is a SPAC where you don't put up your money until we've found a deal, signed a deal, uh, and actually had the SEC approve a registration statement. So I think you know, we're trying to move the, ball, the bar on SPAC uh, technology. It's, it's unfortunate the SEC chose to uh, shut down this uh, this transaction. You'll have to you have to ask them. Um, but uh, I do think uh, the good news. I think everyone can win here. You know, Vivendi I think is quite happy. Um, they, they actually approached us early on as the complexities emerged and said, Bill, would you just buy the stock in Pershing Square uh, directly as opposed to PSTH? But you know, I've, I'm a fiduciary for PSTH. We've been working on the deal for PSTH. And, we, and we're excited to deliver it to our shareholders. And, you know, I moved heaven and earth to make that happen until literally uh, the government sort of put their foot down and said no, at which point we had to go to, uh, I wanted to put uh, Tontine back to where it started. So there were, you know, we lost a little bit of time, unfortunately, uh, we lost a year, but we have plenty of time to do something going forward. And we're gonna do a very, very straightforward merger. Our shareholders are gonna get the benefit of all the warrants that were issued here, which I think is a nice positive for them. We'll get the benefit of the warrants that we paid for um, and we'll do something interesting. And it, I would say there are a number of companies that we started the dialogue with you know, a year ago that weren't ready to go public. You know, now it's a year later. There are, there are some family owned businesses where you know, the family was not ready. You know, a year is a long time and uh, founders uh, or family owners get older. They make different decisions about estate planning, et cetera. You know, we've got a big, you know, capital gains tax uh, potential change here, some changes in estate planning. You know, all of these, I would say, inure to the benefit of the largest uh, SPAC in the world. And I think we're going to find something interesting to do. I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee we're going to work hard and we're going to only do something if it makes a lot of sense for our shareholders. Hey, Bill, philosophically, how tough is it to, to beat the S&P at this point when the S&P does so well? And, and, you know, in the past, you know, we all know general growth. You've had some of the greatest trades in history. But then I remember, you know, Penny or, or, or take your pick. If you do 51% and you're right, you, you're like a genius in this business, I think. But someone's writing in, it's like, what's with, why universal music? Why some legacy dinosaur? Why not, I don't know, crypto, DeFi, cannabis, uh, you know, cloud uh, company or something like that? Sure. Why, why stick with, you know, trying to do such a complicated deal for this old music uh, company and and how hard is it? Have you been beating the sure. S&P uh, for the past three or four years? Yeah, no, I, we've been crushing the S&P, and I, I'm, I'm pleased to say, and we have over a very long period of time, you know, probably a thousand basis point margin net of fees for, you know, so we've done well. Um, but, you, you know, your perception of universal music is going to change once you really understand the business. You're describing kind of, you know, mom and dad's universal music. And actually, in <laughs> my boomer. case, grandpa's the boomer universal view. Music. I know, I, I know, I'm still, right. you know, I'm still right. And to basically, the what, what is, what's, what's, what's changed about universal, okay, is streaming, is Spotify, is Apple Music, is Google Music. The content that is being distributed on all of those modern, sexy technologies is content, a third of which is owned um, by Universal, 40% you know, of the U.S. market, and it's not just the historical content, it's not just the Beatles, it's not just U2, it's not just Sting, it's, you know, top 10 out of the top 10 artists, you know, Drake, you, you know, Taylor Swift, make your list, are Universal artists. You have a company that has incredible historic content and a company that is where every great artist wants to, you know, you know aspiring artist wants to, you know, uh, partner and, and uh, have Universal, you know, help them, you know, break. Uh, as a successful artist. And so owning, I can't think of a business in a content space. I mean, Netflix is amazing, but they have to spend billions and billions of dollars to create content that is not so valuable, you know, the day after you watch it, where music content is really forever. So okay. it's an amazing business. You always talk me They're into probably these the things. most you advanced from a the digital Hong perspective. Kong, you talk me into the Hong Kong dollar. You know what I mean? That peg was supposed to drop off there just so long ago. I, I, you're so <laughs> compelling whenever you're explaining everything that I don't, I, I just never know when to, uh, and, but it's difficult, well, obviously. I would say, you, actually, go look at our batting average. I would say our, our batting, we've had some very high profile failures. Nope. But you can right. kind of count them on, you know, one, one, maybe one and a half hands. And I would say our betting average has been probably 90 plus percent. It's been very, very high. That's we do very, better. very few things. And so as a result, uh, we try to pick things very carefully. But I would say the probability that Universal is going to be a very successful investment over the next five or 10 years uh, is really, really high. Um, okay. That's my view. 
And by the hey, way, Bill, uh, COVID we're, we're all or trying no to make COVID, the business going to do well. Yeah. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about COVID because we're we're all uh, trying to make sense of some of the market action that we saw on Friday and this morning as well. Um, uh, especially now, as there's uh, increased concerns about the Delta variant and what that may mean uh, for the quote unquote return to work and everything else that comes after. Um, We've had lots of conversations on the air with you uh, about your call about COVID and what it meant uh, now close to 18 months ago. And I'm, I'm curious how you're thinking about the markets today. Sure. I, I think it's, again, it's a short term versus a intermediate term thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, I would say, you know, the Delta variant is certainly a negative if you're unvaccinated today. Uh, and if you are unvaccinated today, it's a very high percentage. I, I would say that de- think of the Delta variant is a is an injection of the virus or like a bit like a vaccine for everyone who's not getting a vaccine and i think that's what's going to happen right right and it's going to crowd out all the other variants and that's actually a good thing so if you look at the uk you know 99 percent of the infections the cases are delta cases today it's something i don't know it's 55 percent, whatever the number is in the us or the percentage it's going to go to something approaching 100 because the delta variant has a an r naught if you will of uh, you know something like eight, it's close to measles, meaning it's unbelievably infectious. You walk by someone in a mall, and they breathe, and you breathe in, and you get it. And so the result of that is, uh, you know, unfortunately, if you're older, if you've got diabetes, obesity, you know, some of these uh, comorbidities, it's a very, very threatening thing, and that's why it's very, very dangerous. Um, if I, you know, on the positive side, uh, you know, as long as you survive the Delta variant, it, I think it really increases the chances we get to herd immunity a lot faster. So I think you're going to see a very large number of people get infected, particularly in places in states where the vaccination rate is low. Uh, and that's going to catch them up in terms of people who, who have antibodies. And it's going to crowd the hospitals. Um, although the good news is you've got a very uh, infectious um, uh, variant that is, appears to be not as deadly as some of the others, like the South African right. variant. So it, if this had been a v- deadly variant, a more deadly variant and a more infectious one, I would say we'd be in a different place. But I think the hope is it gets people uh, the antibodies they didn't get from being vaccinated, and that makes them less uh, exposed to the extent how, the Epsilon How does this, though, do you think uh, change, change behavior o- over the next several months and, and therefore change the economic outlook to the degree that, that, that it may or may not. We're looking obviously at airlines, uh, anything related with travel. Um, I don't know if you think it's gonna have an impact on the restaurant business. I know you own several of those. Um, what's, what, what's your take in terms of, of, of how that directly impacts it in the short and longer term? I hope what it does is it motivates anyone who doesn't have a vaccine to get a vaccine. Um, I don't think it's going to change behavior to a great extent. I think people are done, I am, with, uh, you know, being in a cave, right, uh, hiding from the rest of the world. They want to go out. They're going to have fun. They're going to go to restaurants. You're going to see a, a massive, in my view, economic boom. Um, you know, on the margin, there'll be some people who are afraid. Some people are afraid of getting a vaccine, and they're therefore afraid of going out. Um, but I don't think, I think we're going to have an extremely strong economy uh, come the fall, I think people are going to return to work in September, um, and I think companies are going to insist on vaccines, and I think it's a good thing. And you know, I, I have you know even some people in my own company that uh, I would say we probably three people who haven't gotten a vaccine, and um, you know, in one case, you know, sort of a philosophical objection or maybe a religious one. And you know, my question is: you take antibiotics, you take other drugs, well, how, you know, if you take an antibiotic for you know, some other kind of infection, why won't you, you know, have a vaccine? And uh, would you rather, now other people are concerned about the risk. And, uh, you know, the risk is, in my view, a lot greater that you get COVID than if you look at the side effects right. uh, from getting. So what, um, what's, what's going to be the, the, the Bill uh, Ackman the policy Pfizer at the, the office? Of vaccines. What's, what's going to be the policy? So for so those three I'm people who haven't their, been vaccinated. Yeah, so I, I'm doing my best to convince everyone who hasn't gotten a vaccine with by being convincing and then we'll by the time we everyone comes back to work we'll decide what we're going to do about our vaccine policy um also want to ask you just 93 percent yeah i wanted to ask you about inflation uh and 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 both the inflation that we are seeing maybe some of the supply chain issues that are, are are creating some of this uh the big question is this is this the new normal or is it transitory 
I'm in more of closer to the new normal uh, with respect to many sources of inflation. So one, I think inflation is understated. Uh, you know, there's very, very significant uh, kind of, uh, you know, they talk about home equivalent uh, rents or ownership equivalent rents, and those are really understated. If you look at what's going on in the housing market, we have a housing boom. You know, talk to a home builder, you know, there's, everything's being it's on allocation. You have to, you know, and have a friend who knows the CEO in order to get, buy, a, buy a home. <laughs> so that it's, uh, you're seeing housing prices go way up. I think the way the data is collected uh, for, you know, the, uh, the kind of CPI or other inflation numbers really understate what's going on uh, in housing. And that's, you know, approaching a third of inflation. So there's housing inflation, there's real wage inflation, you know, one of the big issues. Uh, and right. I think this is not a transitory thing at all, you know, uh, which is recruiting, let, you know, uh, trying to get people to come work in a hotel, work in a restaurant. I think it's harder now uh, because of uh, some of the stimulus. I think it'll be a little bit easier uh, come September. But a lot of people made sort of life choices and various things. Um, I think you're going to have to pay people to come to work. And I think that's, a, that's actually a big positive. It's probably a long-term positive uh, for the economy. So you've had you know, five trillion of stimulus, you have an increase in wages, you have a lot of savings, you have the stimulus of a lot of people being vaccinated around the same time. All of these things lead to massive, massive economic growth and demand, and we still have an extremely accommodative uh, Federal Reserve. So I think rates are going up. I think rates are going up. Uh, short rates, I think, are going to have to go up a lot faster than people think. Um, you know, and I think today's move is uh, if, if you, I would borrow as much as you can at a long term fixed rate on the basis of today's rates. Um, but I would say, you know, come the turn of the year, I'd be surprised if we're anything close. I think we're going to be meaningfully higher yields as people realize the economy is going to make a very big recovery. And that hopefully Delta variant, uh, in a way, vaccinated, if you will, uh, exposed a lot of people. Uh, hopefully, you know, they, they survive the exposure and we get to something closer to herd immunity, and we get more people inspired uh, to get a vaccine. And uh, you could see Bill, a really, Bill's, really strong 2022. To the, to the extent that there's a pullback today, and there has been uh, on Friday, does that mean that you're, you're a buyer in this market? Especially of the, the, some of the, I mean, you, you've been making the big play that the world's gonna come back. So we're about to spend $4 billion on Universal Music Group stock, so we're very, very excited about that. We're not like a buyer of the market sort of in general. Um, you know, markets in general, are, are, I'm not as good as assessing. Uh, you know, I have to look at every company one at a time to tell you whether it's cheap or expensive. Um, but we like the businesses we own. We're not, uh, you know, we're, we're excited about uh, the companies we own. We're excited about our, our view of where the economy is headed. We try to own businesses that are very insulated from the economy. Um, what I can tell you is people are gonna be listening to more music from more devices in more places, in more countries, uh, you know, six months from now, a year from now, three years from now, 10 right. years from now, and owning a royalty on people listening to music is really a great place to be and having one of the best management teams in the industry. So I'm, I'm sad, if you will, uh, for Tontine. They didn't get the chance. And I'm, I, we've done a good job, I think, telling the story. The company's going to come public, you know, third week in September. People have an opportunity to buy the stock there. It's actually better for them to buy the stock there as long as you can get it at a good price because it will be liquid. It won't be locked up. And we're going to focus so we deliver for our Tontine shareholders a uh, very, very attractive regular way merger. And so in a way, we have to thank the SEC. Let me just right. say one thing. I, I'm not being in any way critical of the SEC. I want to be really clear. We have the best capital markets in the world. We have the envy of the world in the capital markets. And that's because we have the best uh, regular, the best uh, investor protections in the world. It's really important to keep that. I respect the SEC's judgment on this. At the end of the day, perhaps everyone ends up being happier, Vivendi's happier, Maybe our investors are happier, um, the short-term investors are happier, and hopefully the longer-term investors in, in Tontin team we can deliver for. And if they right. want to buy Universal, they buy it in a couple months. And so thank you to the SEC. We ended up hey. in this outcome, which I, I would say if you had asked hey, me Bill, a week you, ago, I would say there's not a chance this would happen. You've got 18 months now to buy uh, another company. One of the arguments you made, by the way, around getting the second bite of the apple, I think, was that a smaller company would be easier to digest and there'd be a, a bigger pool. Uh, Two or three of the big companies have been speculated about. Airbnb has already gone public. A lot of people talked about Stripe, uh, Michael Bloomberg's company. Uh, how hard do you think it's going to be to find the right company over the next 18 months? So the good news is we have a, what I call a running start. Uh, we, we talked to a lot of people before we settled on Universal, and then we stopped talking to people. Um, but a lot of those people, we can easily re-engage uh, those conversations, I would say, quickly. 
Um, and we've gotten a pretty good advertisement about this entity. And it's, you know, look, I think the other thing that's really important to us here is I told uh, Vincent Bellari that we're going to close. And I, I said, even if for some reason something happens that we don't expect and Tontine doesn't close, we're going to close. And I think having a reputation for getting deals done and having an ability to work and, you know, address people's sometimes complicated situations is something that we can bring to the table. We have a one of a kind entity. We do have the ability to shrink it, if you will. We could always pay a dividend to people uh, pre-transaction if we came to a view that the entity was too large uh, for a particular uh, deal. And there are things we can do to address the size issue. I, I think size is gonna be an asset for us. Um, we need one transaction. We're super focused. Uh, it's our highest priority. And I expect we'll, we'll get something done. I can't guarantee it. I can't promise it. Um, but we have all the right incentives and, you know, we're very long term from a reputation point of view. Uh, we've got a lot of people excited about uh, our Persian Square Tontine Holdings and I, and I want to deliver for them. Bill Ackman, uh, we appreciate you joining us uh, on this day uh, when the news broke um, and being with us exclusively this morning. Hope to uh, see you very soon and follow the progress uh, both of Universal Music and the rest of Persian Square. Thanks so much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. All right, coming up, much more on the markets as we see the uh, the futures now down over 500 points uh, on the Dow and the. Uh